All right. Welcome everyone to an evening's discussion about this book by Tony Lerman, Anthony Lerman on the book itself, which is the name he writes under in public. Um, Tony has been thinking about working on involved in issues of Zionism and anti-Semitism for many, many decades from an early youth not wasted entirely in Habonim, from which he has emerged as probably Britain's leading expert on anti-Semitism, having fallen out of favor in a big way with the establishment, uh, having been before that a key researcher in the Institute for Jewish Public Policy on the very issue we're discussing this evening, or on what anti-Semitism used to be before it became what it is now. And without further ado, I'm going to ask Tony to introduce the session. He will have half an hour to do so. So sit back and if you've read the book, have your memories refreshed. And if not, you will hear a very interesting argument developed by Tony. Over to you, Tony. Well, um, I appreciate that very much, Richard. Thank you. And um, uh, I'm delighted to have been invited to give this, this talk uh, and I should get stuck in straight away. Um, so when I started writing this book uh, five years ago, I began it by quoting a comment by Professor David Feldman made in a February 2017 lecture. My starting point, he said, is our present confusion over what anti-Semitism is. When it comes to anti-Semitism, many of us literally don't know what we're talking about and are happy to admit it. And as for the rest of us who think we do know what anti-Semitism is, we are congenitally unable to agree among ourselves." End quote. Of course, I could not know for certain whether by the time the book appeared, the quote would still apply. But if I needed any independent validation of the continued relevance of David's words, conclusions I had already myself reached at that time, it handily came to me five years on in May this year when I received Peter Beinart's endorsement of my book. Uh, quote in the contemporary debate about anti-Semitism is both incoherent and appalling. It's incoherent because there is no consensus definition about what anti-Semitism is, end quote. During these years, there have been many attempts from different political perspectives to explain why this was the case, but also and more often to deny that there was any genuine confusion on the grounds that it was just the anti-Semitism deniers who were confused, those who refused to accept the so-called internationally recognized IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which codifies the new anti-Semitism as anti-Semitic anti-Zionism. For the working definitions promoters, IHRA settled the matter once and for all. Nonetheless, a constant stream of controversies, most prominently the labor anti-Semitism crisis, provided seemingly limitless material for continued bitter um, while some efforts to explain the confusion had much merit, most interventions were made by protagonists rushing to judgment on the basis of very little considered reflection on what had, or so often had not, occurred. I held the view that to fully understand what was going on, it was necessary to take into account the wider historical and political context and the longer view, and to bring to bear some new or neglected analytical approaches and experience to our understanding of where we are now. And this was what I aimed to do in my book. Now, I'm sure that not all of you who signed up for this webinar have read my book. Uh, so let me first provide an overview of the book's arguments and conclusions, and then focus on some of my ideas I think are of particular relevance for those looking for new ways to confront the ignorance, distortion, misrepresentation, exaggeration and manipulation around anti-Semitism that feeds anti-Palestinian racism and diverts attention from real anti-Semitism, a set of circumstances that make Jews more, not less vulnerable. 
In my book, I show that over the last 40 years, anti-Semitism has been redefined as new anti-Semitism, both when discussed in the public space and as a subject of academic study, through the, though the, the redefinition has not been universally accepted, of course. Central to that redefinition is the myth of the collective Jew, the resonant metaphor for Israel defined as the Jewish state. Those responsible for the IHRA redefinition insist that it was a result of years of scholarly research and discussion. In fact, it was originally and fundamentally a political project opportunistically planned and implemented by a small group behind closed doors. It was not an open-ended academic endeavor. In tracing the development of the concept of new antisemitism and the discourse used to disseminate it, I follow the course of discussion on antisemitism, Zionism, and anti-Zionism using reports of conferences and seminars, quoting from relevant journals, magazines, and newspapers, and focusing on the thinking of a few people whose teaching, writing, and interventions in public debates were especially influential on the way that the new antisemitism and collective Jew discourses became dominant. I begin by quoting data from polls showing widespread public confusion and ignorance about antisemitism and what the word means and deep division over it among Jews. Disinformation in the media about alleged antisemitic incidents did not help. Also, Jewish defense bodies and representative organizations often exaggerated the degree to which anti-Semitism was a serious current danger, even when this conflicted with everyday experience. I pay special attention to one particular area of confusion, the use and abuse of anti-Semitic stereotypes and tropes. This has been an important factor in some of the key controversial incidents of alleged and unproven anti-Semitism in recent years, especially in relation to Jeremy Corbyn. Everyone seems to think they know what the trope is, but this is far from the truth. Arguments over these incidents, most of which are judged to be devoid of anti-Semitism, continue to this day. Much of the confusion is closely linked to the question of the relationship between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, which itself is central to one of the key themes of the book, interrogating the notion of the new, new anti-Semitism, said to be spread by anti-Israel left and Islamic groups to the state fueled by them. For many Jewish, uh, for Jewish observers, this proved that anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism were one and the same. I therefore examined how the idea developed from the 1970s, focusing first on the angry reaction among Jewish groups and Israel's supporters to the adoption of UN General Assembly Resolution 3379, which determined that Zionism is a form of racism and racial discrimination. The collapse of communism in 1989 brought significant changes. For some, new freedoms and the end of state-sponsored anti-Semitism and restrictions on organized Jewish life of popular anti-Semitism generated by new groups nostalgic for the fascist and Nazi traditions pre-1939. This brought a significant diminution in anti-Semitism for some and a resurgence of it for others. Panic over that resurgence dissipated, but there was mounting alarm at alleged growing new anti-Semitism. So much so that by the turn of the century, new anti-Semitism was well on the way to becoming the orthodox understanding of anti-Semitism. This did not come about through discussions alone, of course. An institutional infrastructure developed, described by uh, an academic, uh, Dr. Esther Romain, in an article in Patterns of Prejudice, as the, quote, anti-new anti-Semitism transnational field of racial governance, which fleshed out and dissemin disseminated new anti-Semitism theory. I mapped the entities popul populating this field, the Israeli government, pro-Israel advocacy groups, Zionist organizations, Jewish communal defense bodies, research institutes, university departments, think tanks, sympathetic governments, and international governmental and non-governmental bodies, and more. Of crucial importance 
was the Israeli government's decision in 1988 to establish the Government Monitoring Forum on Antisemitism with the aim of implementing a new policy with the help of the Mossad, putting Israel at the head of international Jewish efforts to combat antisemitism, increasingly focused on alleged antisemitic criticism of Israel. The policy waxed and waned during the 1990s as Oslo came to dominate Israel's agenda. But by the turn of the century, most Jewish organizations worldwide, some previously somewhat skeptical, fell in line and Israel engaged in exploiting the issue of antisemitism more seriously. The central tenet of new antisemitism is though contested throughout the 1990s and beyond, ultimately became through pressure from institutions, academics and activists, the main plank of the dominant discourse about antisemitism. But the key turning point was 9-11. Reports of an explosion of global anti-Semitism, said to be directed largely at Israel, led to new anti-Semitism discourse becoming ever more dominant. Israel reacted by reconfiguring and upgrading the status of its institutions dealing with anti-Semitism at the governmental level in the early 2000s, and strengthened its developing world leadership role, determinedly weaponizing anti-Semitism to deflect criticism of its policies. The scene is then set for a decisive step change, the codification of new antisemitism in the working definition of antisemitism published on the website of the European Monitoring Center on Racism and Xenophobia, the EUMC, in 2005. I already mentioned that this was a result of a political project. Participants invited to contribute to, to, dis to discussions had to be sympathetic to new antisemitism analysis. An informal practical understanding of antisemitism had prevailed for decades among antisemitism researchers. But the heads of the Jewish groups driving the EUMC discussions insisted that there was a clamor for a new definition without which new antisemitism could not be successfully combated. There was, of course, no clamor, and combating antisemitism was not in crisis. Nonetheless, new antisemitism theory radically broke the consensus, the EUMC working definition destroyed it completely. Post 9-11, the growing new anti-Semitism institutional infrastructure helped generate and amplify the moral panic. In a very significant move, Israel finally committed itself to full occupation of the leadership role in the fight against the new anti-Semitism. By the early 2010s, government and state institutions and agencies but were contributing decisively to coordinating anti-antisemitism activity in many countries, further adding to the field of transnational racial governance. Meanwhile, the EUMC working definition had achieved significant international attention and approbation, but the organization's successor, the Fundamental Rights Agency, distanced itself from the text. Under pressure from the major US Jewish organizations in particular, and backed by the Israeli government. It was reintroduced with marginal changes into the public domain by the IHRA in 2016. It was assiduously disseminated by IHRA officials and the Jewish organizations and quickly attracted very favorable international attention. At this point, with IHRA providing Israel with unprecedented cover for its anti-Palestinian agenda, I deconstruct the narrative at the heart of the working definition, the notion of Israel, the persecuted collective Jew among the nations, which is both metaphor and concept. I expose this as a myth. A state cannot have the attributes of a human being. Furthermore, by making it untouchable, the myth encourages deification of the state. From a Jewish religious point of view, this is also idolatrous. And it is anti-Semitic too, because the parallel reduces the Jew to a singularity, implying that all Jews are the same, an obvious anti-Semitic trope. And finally, the concept is also blatantly racist in another sense. It completely erases the Palestinian minority from the Israeli reality.
I show that seeing Israel as a persecuted collective Jew is reinforced by the attack by Jewish groups on human rights culture and organizations for being an alleged anti-Semitic conspiracy against the Jewish state. Moreover, I also demonstrate how Israel leverages its very favorable geopolitical situation. Its status as probably the leading military and economic power in the region, its normalizing of relations with many Arab states, and its fruitful relations with Russia, China, and India to secure acquiescence in the government's portrayal of the state as under attack from viral anti-Semitic delegitimization. I then discuss four other anti-Semitism linked discourses that are also deployed to reinforce the collective Jew myth. First, reference to acting against anti-Semitism as a war, even though you cannot fight a war against an abstract noun. I argue that it's not enough to defend its use because it is only a metaphor. It dangerously raises unrealistic expectations as to what can be achieved. Moreover, the use of the word reveals much about the problematic, problematic nature of anti-antisemitism activity. As I go on to demonstrate, even the generals waging this so-called war acknowledge that it is not being won, yet they get away with portraying failure as success by, in effect, saying there is no alternative. Second, the use of medical analogies, anti-Semitism as a virus. Such analog analogies, I believe, rarely come with, with proposed cures, and they turn anti-Semites, for whom anti-Semitism is a choice, into unwitting victims. Third, the insistence that nothing less than eradication, elimination, or rooting out, Keir Starmer, of anti-Semitism are acceptable strategies for dealing with the problem. We may, of course, yearn for the end of anti-Semitism, but like any racism, I contend, its eradication is impossible. But constantly demanding it serves the interests of anti-new anti-Semitism warriors because it sanctions the continuity of complaint, which acts as a permanent barrier to the attainment of justice for the Palestinians. Finally, apocalypticism, repeated prophecies of anti-Semitic Armageddon. The prophets of anti-Semitic doom, whether they be journalists, activists, and academics alike, see all Jews as vulnerable, but most serious, of course, is the alleged ever-present threat of annihilation of Israel by hostile Islamic forces. Belief sustains this narrative, not evidence. So it matters not if it doesn't happen. And if the apocalyptic, apocalyptic claims are questioned, it's the questioner who comes under suspicion for downplaying anti-Semitism. The book starts with confronting confusion and ends with the stark reality of its consequences. Anti-Zionism, a form of legitimate political discourse and belief, has been conflated with anti-Semitism, a form of racial hostility and hatred. This equation, labeled new anti-Semitism, which targets the collective Jew, a bogus metaphor and concept, was codified in the form of the IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism, with the result that anti-Semitism has been redefined to be what it is not. Redefinition has resulted in the production of a racist charter actively applied against the Palestinians based on the prohibition of freedom of speech. And I'm afraid I could find nothing to say in my conclusion in the book that offered any serious evidence of imminent change in this dire situation. Yes, I'm afraid it's a pessimistic book, but I also conclude that resistance is not just an option, but a necessity. And my contribution to that res resistance is to be brutally honest about how we got to where we are now. Without that, it's hard to see a way forward. Now, it's clear from my book that two overarching areas of my concerns are, one, the institutional infrastructure, anti-new anti-Semitism, transnational field of racial governance, and two, new anti-Semitism discourse, but especially around the notion of the collective Jew and how its various iterations serve as a shield protecting Israel from criticism. Ideally, I would be advocating the dismantling of both. But as far as the first is concerned, obviously achieving its demise is a pipe dream. 
However, it should be rem remembered that there are institutions, apart from our own dissenting networks, that set themselves apart from the anti-new anti-Semitism racial governance field and can be allies in countering its influence. They represent a counter-narrative of great weight. No, the mess of anti-Semitism discussion is by no means just confined to political groups. The academy is tearing itself apart over anti-Semitism. The preponderance of research bodies focusing on current anti-Semitism are aligned with and disseminate works suffused with new anti-Semitism thinking. And there is nothing genteel about their work. So it is not just good scholarship but serving the cutting agenda of the government of Israel. A research institute or think tank devoted to truth telling on anti Semitism and exposing anti Palestinian racism disguised as objective research within a broad anti racist contact context would not go amiss. But bodies like JDL clearly do not have access to resources to create such an institution. Dismantling and replacing the narrative is, in my view, a different matter. What I've learned from writing this book is just how powerful words are in setting the agenda and controlling the narrative. And space your, uh, and your occupy that space and your opponents are always playing catch up. Dismantling the narrative, the discourse propping up new anti-Semitism is certainly possible. That does not just mean subjecting it to searching critique. It's necessary, but what has to result from it is a good news story conveying a positive outcome for all from the river to the sea and in a uh, affected ethnic, religious, and cultural communities worldwide, which can cover far more than just Jews, Muslims, Israelis, and Palestinians. The new anti-Semitism story is irredeemably negative, dispiriting, uninspiring. One of the sources of the collective Jew metaphor is the lacrimose view of Jewish history, which argues that Jewish historic evolution is largely characterized as the constant repetition of Jewish sufferings. This is not historically accurate. It offers no hope, and worshipping the Jewish state as the corrective to that condition is sterile. Pro-Palestinian Jews experience abuse and demonization, but I don't think that that does not mean that dismantling the collective Jew and the positive narrative requires demonization of the state of Israel. However, aggrieved by the actions of the state anyone might justifiably be. What Israeli governments do can be truly horrific, but it should not be seen as exceptional. States do these things. It's appallingly normal. I say we need to normalize discourse about Israel, not exceptionalizing it. The Israelis are past masters at exceptionalizing their situation. A normal state can be expected to follow rules, not break a state citizens. Another area of vulnerability in the new anti-Semitism regime that my book reveals is the failing nature of the strategy of those leading the effort to combat anti-Semitism. I've mentioned this before. And we know they are failing by their own admission. Their anti-Semitism reports consistently show anti-Semitism getting worse. They will hardly ever criticize those prophesying an imminent apocalypse. They stand before parliamentary select committees U.S. congressional hearings and U.N. committees and speak of the existential dangers posed by current anti-Semitism. And since they and the politicians they are addressing will be satisfied with nothing less than complete eradication, eradication or eradication of anti-Semitism, while at the same time speaking of it as an incurable disease, for anyone who is really listening, they are in a double bind. But as they are the main voices being listened to and are seen as the experts, what they are confronting is seen to be beyond anyone's control. The politicians are rarely presented with any alternative leadership in the fight against anti-Semitism. This cozy self-reinforcing reality is ripe for exposure. Now seen to have moral authority, for example, by operating under the aegis of organizations like the IHRA, you find remarkably little by way of searching critique of the leadership of those claiming that they are waging a war on anti-Semitism. And quite often, those of us who do criticize feel obliged to preface our criticisms 
with acknowledgement of just how serious is the problem of anti-Semitism today in order to get a hearing in the public space, even though we know how exaggerated it can be. And by doing this, we unwittingly contribute to the kind of hierarchy of racism revealed in the Ford Report. I found a highly original and very effective method, I think, for critiquing anti-antisemitism anti in the work of the Columbia University professor Gil Anijar, who, in a, in, who has two very good articles on this, who wants to see himself uh, as a warrior in this war, but is deeply troubled by the, and I quote, nearly complete lack of public self-reflection on the part of the thinkers, writers, militants, and leaders of WAS, as he puts it, the war against anti-Semitism. Crucially, if the war is a political and social movement, Anijar expects that its leaders would, quote, vocally proclaim its affinity with its centrality in the spread of democracy and freedom, its tendency towards realizing equality or or towards crystallizing privilege, end quote. But nonetheless, the answer is come by. Statements by the war's leaders are replete with such proclamations, and yet the evidence suggests precisely the opposite. The war's principal victims are the Palestinians, denied democracy, freedom, and equality. The so-called war on anti-Semitism is essentially an elite enterprise dominated by governing structures and official bodies. It is not a social movement. There are no grassroots clamoring or mobilizing for action. Its leaders expect to address and influence establishments, security forces, governments. They are accountable to no one. The war's sources of funding are not transparent, and it relies on the fact that Jews do count. With this, I've now offered some building blocks from alternative discourse or narrative as one basis for confronting the false anti-Semitism narrative of which the IHRA working definition is seemingly emblem, em, seminally emblematic. One final point. So much comes down to the equation of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Like the myth of the collective Jew, a core assertion of new anti-Semitism. The notion is historically and politically without foundation. However, many of us, who unfailingly point this out, nonetheless have often, uh, ha often acknowledged that the issue is that anti-Zionism can cross a point on a continuum and merge with anti-Semitism. For many years, I subscribed to this idea, but in my reflections on this as I was writing my book, I came to the conclusion that this is false. The implication seems to be that full-blown anti-Semitism and full-blown anti-Zionism are the two ends of this continuum, as if there is some organic relationship between the two things. There isn't. The two are completely different phenomena, and we cede far too much to the anti-anti-Semitism forces maintaining the idea that this continuum exists. So I hope you find my explanation for the hot mess Vienar refers to plausible and the ideas for deploying some of my conclusions to craft a new narrative that dismantles the new anti-Semitism useful, a term we need to cancel and which even its prompters rarely use these days, not because they've abandoned it, but rather because it has so successfully become the default understanding of anti-Semitism, there's no need to use the word new anymore. It's the only anti-Semitism most Jews now recognize. There is a great deal more thought in my book on this. So if you haven't yet, I end by urging you please to read it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Thanks enormously for that presentation. The sound broke up at odd times, but overall, uh, I, I think it, it, it was okay. utterly coherent and, and compelling. We now move on to three short contributions relating to it. The first was to have been given by Nira Yuval Davis uh, this evening, but a few days ago, she had to have an operation and has had to send her apologies. I'm sure we all wish her a speedy recovery. But I will 
present some of the ideas she has been working on in a short presentation based on her writings. For those who don't know her, Nira has spent an academic lifetime studying racisms. She describes herself as a diasporic Israeli socialist feminist, Professor Emeritus and Honorary Director of the Center Research Center on Migration, Refugees and Belonging at the University of East London, ex-president of the Research Committee on Racism, Nationalism and Ethnic Relations at the International Sociological Association and founder member of Social Scientists Against the Hostile <laughs> Environment. She's also an activist and a member of JVL's education group. She's recently presented a paper to the Van Leer Institute in Tel Aviv, which looks at the question of anti-Semitism as a form of racism in the widest possible perspective. It provides an overview of how debates about racism and anti-Semitism have developed since the Second World War and comes to conclusions which align with those that Tony has presented this evening, viz that anti-Semitism should be approached as a form of racism and that the attempts to construct it as something different from racism, racism suffer from both conceptual and moral inconsistencies. I see it as entirely complementary to Tony's work, helping us to situate anti-Semitism a form of racism in a much broader theorization of racism in general. So in her absence, let me just very briefly cover some of the themes she looks at. She looks at three major debates or contestations that have taken place in academic discussions. First, how traditional academic disciplinary approaches to study, studying racism and antisemitism have approached the subject, whether social psychologically, in terms of social policy problems, in terms of political economy. She looks at how the framework of modernity has seen the relationship between antisemitism and racism and how the notion of new anti-Semitism has now become entangled in that contestation. And she looks at more recent understandings of racism and anti-Semitism in the theory and methodology and politics of what is called intersectionality and the encounter there too with the new anti-Semitism. What is interesting in them all for our purposes this evening is the position that anti-Semitism plays or doesn't play at different times in their formulations and the way in which the question of Palestine absent before 1967 slowly forces its way into the different narratives. I just want to highlight the latest area of contention, intersectionality. For those like Nira, it is an approach that preserves the truth of the lived experience of various racialized groups by putting them into relation with the experience of others in a way that avoids pitting them against each other, but rather allows us to focus on the social position, social structures and power relations which underpin all racism. It has brought forth a bitter reaction expressed most strongly recently perhaps by Alan Dershowitz, quote, all decent people must join in calling out intersectionality for what it is, a euphemism for anti-American, anti-Semitic and anti-Israel bigotry. It's an interesting uh, uh, running together of different themes. Uh, so too fighting against anti-Semitism, fighting against racism, against Southerners, people from what we used to call the third world has become more and more of a zero sum game. If you support the Palestinians, you're against Israel and therefore likely to be anti-Semitic. And this is what is playing itself out currently in the anti-racist movement, particularly in the States, but also elsewhere. And this is where Tony's work comes in, analyzing the development of the new anti-Semitism narrative and its growing hegemony, explaining how we've reached this point. I want to end with a broad definition of racism developed by Nira social scientists against the hostile environment, which places anti-Semitism within a much wider framework. According this approach, to this approach, racism, or rather the process of racialization, is a mode of thinking, cultural, ideological, historical, and practice into subjective, institutional, systematic, which constructs immutable boundaries between collectivities, which are used to naturalize fixed hierarchical power relations between them. It has two central logics, that of exclusion, the ultimate form of which is genocide, and that of exploitation, the ultimate logic of which is slavery, 
in most concrete historical situations, these two logics are practiced in a complementary way and involve different ways of hierarchization, subjugation, and the use of what is considered to be legitimate and illegitimate modes of violence. Any signifiers of boundaries can be used to construct these racializations. From the color of the skin to the shape of the elbow to accent or mode of dress, the meaning of these signifiers shifts historically and they are contested. A lot of the work in the UK and elsewhere has tended to focus either on issues of racism or issues of migration. The report issued by social scientists against the hostile environment argues you cannot understand one without the other, that they construct each other via different political projects of belonging. This is similar to the way to work on anti-Semitism has been carried out separately and sometimes in a mutually exclusionary way from discussions of other forms of racism and racialization. In both cases, such a separation has been problematic to the understanding of as well as to the fight against different kinds of racial mm -hmm. racism and racializations. The way forward is clearly not to allow anti-Semitism to be as distinct as a distinct form of oppression opposed to racism in general, but to be firmly embedded in an overarching analysis of racism and to be contested in alliance with, in theory and practice, those fighting other forms of racism. That's well, I hope uh, a, a very partial summary of the kind of generalized approach and framework which Nira and others are trying to present and within which Tony's work fits absolutely as an exemplar of the study of one form of racism. I'd like now to go on and to call Mickey David to make a contribution followed by Charlotte Williams. We will then ask Tony, if he wants to come in at that stage with any comments or otherwise move to opening the discussion up. Mickey. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start by praising and thanking you, Tony, for an excellent uh, book. Uh, it's beautifully researched and well-crafted uh, about the changing definitions or non-definitions of anti-Semitism. Although I thought I was familiar with the history of this, I found a great deal of new information and insights in the book. The book also focuses centrally on the way in which different Jews, and I think this is really important, uh, argue about what constitutes anti-Semitism. It's extremely nuanced and helpful, so I just want to pull out some key points for discussion and critique. Uh, it, it is extremely important to start by noting that the central focus is on the ways in which different Jewish groups internationally have sought to define these matters. So it's not really a debate outside of Jewish communities, but a fight within. Uh, and it is not really about Palestinians at all. In fact, uh, most of the debate excludes them, as you've already mentioned in your presentation today. This might appear confusing to groups outside various different Jewish communities. And this has certainly been my experience in the workshops that we've conducted online with JVL in the last two to three years. Importantly, this book helps to clarify how anti-Semitism has become a political football as you've already noted. What should also be noted at the outset is the narrowness of the debate, although it has become of global reach and become as if it's the most important issue in town. There's very, very little on other forms of racism and the question of BAME or Palestine and nothing on how these issues intersect as Richard has already noted with reference to uh, Nira's work, with other forms of discrimination and in inequality, let alone prejudice. And for example, there's nothing in these debates on the issues that both Nira and I hold dear uh, as uh, socialist feminists. There's nothing at all on sexism or misogyny, 
for example. And these issues are also rife in major Jewish communities. So to start my brief comments on this and to open up discussion, uh, I want to ask, what is the difference between new anti-Semitism and old anti-Semitism? And how has this been clarified by you, Tony? However, what you point out in your book, and again tonight, is that the notion of definition itself is never really clarified. So actually, we're not given really helpful ways in which we can debate this, except at a broad uh, level. Briefly, I think you argue that old anti-Semitism was about hatred of Jews as individuals and has been different from non-Jews and discrimination against Jews with no necessary link or elision with the idea of Zion or most recently with Israel and the state of Israel. As you argue and provide evidence for, uh, from the mountains of literature, new antisemitism has arisen in the last 30 to 50 years, or mainly since the 1967 <clears throat> war, as a way of arguing especially uh, about the state of Israel and the Israeli government, as being a form of criticism of Israel, becoming eventually a collective Jew. You also show how there is a dispute within the literature about the origins of the debate about new antisemitism, with some more recent writers dating the debates from the 21st century and the developments in the issues around the uses of the notion of the Holocaust. Uh, and I want to highlight that a bit because I think uh, the Holocaust is another theme that wasn't brought out earlier in uh, linking the huge developments in these debates. Uh, new antisemitism then is more than just criticism, discrimination or hatred of Jews, but is also is conflated with criticism, discrimination or hatred of Israel and often, but not always with anti-Zionism. Zionism and anti-Zion and or anti-Zionism was not involved in old forms of anti-Semitism. For example, if we go back to medieval forms of anti-Semitism and even forms of anti-Semitism in the 19th and early 20th century, culminating in Nazism and its rise in the 1930s. So, as you've argued, but to pick out again, the creation of the State of Israel has been really significant to the new anti-Semitism. Although the arguments about new anti-Semitism do not date from the creation of the state in 1948, but rather from the war of 1967, almost 20 years later. <laughs> Even more importantly, and linked to this, the Holocaust has become a key to definitions of anti-Semitism with the International Holocaust, uh, what does the R stand for, I've forgotten already, IHRA working definition, deliberately obfuscating and obscuring definitions and ideas. However, the term Holocaust is also of more recent origin than the Second World War, becoming of use from the late 1970s, around the time that the new anti-Semitism has also taken hold. And for example, just to illustrate that, uh, Claude Lanzmann's uh, film, Shoah, was one of the first to use that word Shoah or Holocaust as a way of talking about what happened in the Second World War. As you argue, these issues about the role of the Holocaust in notions of the new anti-Semitism rose to the fore in the 21st century. And in the confused debates around the EU uh, MC, the European Monitoring Center on Racism and Xenophobia uh, in 2005, uh, followed by the IHRA definition some 10, 11 years later. <clears throat> 
The debate about these different forms of anti-Semitism and so-called definitions is fundamentally an argument among Jews and Israelis, but socialist or left-wing Jews are singled out for particular condemnation and in particular for their support for Palestine and Palestinians. And I think it might be uh, significant to note that those uh, definitions arose as you've argued tonight, after 9-11. Uh, the only other debate that uh, centers on uh, Zionists involved in this are perhaps, and you mentioned this in the book, but didn't really mention it tonight, is the role played by Christian Zionists in the US especially, and you do devote a chapter to this element of the argument. Uh, the ways in which the debates play out in the USA uh, versus the UK uh, are somewhat different, uh, particularly uh, recently. For example, uh, in the UK, there was the creation of the anti-Semitism czar by the Tories and the giving of that post to a non-Jewish man, the ex-Labour Party MP, John Mann. Whereas very recently, as you point out in the book, it was Biden who created Deborah Lipstadt, who is the daughter of Holocaust survivors and who had to endure a rather horrific uh, attack upon her by uh, the, the mm. right in this country uh, when it took place. And she has just been appointed uh, Biden's anti-Semitism envoy. So to bring this uh, brief uh, comment upon your book, the debate about the new anti-Semitism, as you've already argued, has sown huge amounts of confusion rather than added clarity and has conflated anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism and with uh, Nazism and or the Holocaust. And it's become uh, uh, fundamentally about criticism of Israel rather than arguing that anti-Semitism is one form of racism and discrimination amongst many. And it has also become, uh, as an aside, uh, an attack on socialism and socialist Jews who raise these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Yes, Charlotte. Okay, hi. So uh, my particular question is, how can we start a conversation with other Jews who have become convinced of the dangers they face from Jews like us, the wrong sort of Jews? And it is partly a question and partly an attempt to answer it, partly from what I think might be your ideas, Tony, and partly not, partly possibly mine, um, and ones I've picked up elsewhere. Um, so in thinking about this question, I'm aware that every Jewish person in this meeting has at least a few stories to tell about relatives, friends or comrades they have fallen out with because of our stance on Israel-Palestine. And those who aren't Jewish will have plenty of examples of being ousted too. I always feel there's a fault line in this debate, and it's 1967. It seems acceptable to take issue with Israel's human rights abuses and aggressive takeover of occupied territory. We can even speak relatively unscathed about the apartheid judgment. But if we then talk about the racism endemic in the creation of Israel, then we're beyond the pale. And we, or I at any rate, meet shocked faces and what about the Holocaust? Maybe we can never have a dialogue with other Jews until 1948 is understood, acknowledged, talked about, atoned for even. And until right of return and each people's understanding of it is grappled with. In my own development, it wasn't until I was taught about 1948 that I started to think in a different way about my history. Tony, I really like your concept of the hot mess we are in. I know hot mess isn't your term, but I like it. Um, I think it says it so well. Um, Jews who have lived in this country for generations 
as well as those who came in as refugees from Nazi Europe, just hear anti-Semitism and are understandably terrified. We know that they have been manipulated, but perhaps we need to engage with their fears by placing the emphasis on the threat of fascism. We need to be clear and proud that we are a diasporic people and cannot fight racism alone. So for example, we can show solidarity with refugees and remind anti-immigration Jews that we too have had to up sticks and leave our homes and countries and have not immediately known how to fit in when we've arrived. I know that JVL works very hard to make alliances with other groups, both Jewish and non-Jewish. We work for a world in which Jews are not exceptionalized. We work to demonstrate that anti-Semitism is just one kind of racism and point out that it is not the most prevalent. But other Jewish groups are suspicious, suspicious of us. Some of them think we don't take anti-Semitism seriously enough. I have never seen evidence of this among my colleagues, and it's a disappointment that working with others seems hard to make a reality. <clears throat> so we can be clear that we value our Jewish identity, joining with other Jews in marking traditions whenever we can. Ellie Makova echoes your message in saying, our task is to, is to nurture ways of being Jewish beyond Zionism. The way I understand this is that celebrating our traditions brings us into contact with the right sort of Jew and can be an important ground for opening up conversations and changing hearts and minds, even if we have to start in small ways. It's important that we show that there have always been different communities within the Jewish community. When I was a teenager in South London from a family of emigres, and mixed with young Jews from Northwest London in my Zionist youth movement, I looked upon them as a race apart. When we had gatherings with young people from Manchester, Liverpool and Glasgow, they too were very different again. There are many ways we can open up dialogue about our differences, as well as our similarities beyond what we think of, beyond what we think of Israel and Zionism. <clears throat> Above, above all, as you say, we can show or persuade other Jews that Zionism is not a necessary part of their Jewish identity. Tony, can we call you to respond to the great diversity of thoughts and comments and issues raised? Um, well, thank you, Richard. Um, you can call me. Um, but I think within seven minutes, it's going to be a bit difficult to reply to all these really very, very interesting and, and fascinating points and questions. So um, there's no way I can, I can cover it all. Um, I would say one, one general point, which I think focuses on qu quite a lot of the things that were raised, and that is, um, you know, how do we change the, the narrative? Or if, if, you know, if you have a new uh, narrative, you know, how do we make it work? How do we influence people? Um, how can we speak to, um, other Jews uh, in a way that will make them listen and so on and so forth. Um, and I think uh, on, on that point, from my perspective, it's a matter of, uh, it's a matter of um, critical mass, frankly. Um, and one of the great problems that we've always had, those of us, you know, with the views that we have is um, we're, we're Quite diff there, there are quite a, f a few little groups, um, and uh, uh, we don't have crit critical mass. And I think that yes, clearly, uh, having a positive discourse, I think, is needed. It's not it's not enough. I think there has to be critical mass as well. That's the way uh, that I think we one one may might make a breakthrough. I think example in the United States is important here. Jewish voice for peace jvp which you know has expanded greatly they are they've you know they reached a critical mass where where the mainstream organizations have to take notice of them so i think i think critical mass is an important thing and um that's something which some of us you know have spoken about before and tried to sort of get on top of 
I think that's that's important. Um, uh, I'm, I was I, I was delighted to hear of Nira's views, and you know I, I think that's very positive uh, that that uh, you know she endorses effectively the kind of things I'm saying, and I think that there's something there which can be can be can be can be worked on. Um, I think the important thing about new anti-Semitism, uh, Mickey, is that 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 what I'm arguing is that there is no such thing as new anti-Semitism. It's a it's a fiction. Um, uh, and that's 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 important. So I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on, you know, what what makes it up. We know what is supposed to make it up. But from my point of view, the argument is that it's a it's a false it's it, it's 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 a false thing, and th that's what we have to have what we have to um, e expose. Um, uh, the question of periodization and the question of when did new anti-Semitism as an idea emerge. In my book, I make it clear that there's the, the, no definite, a clear date when there, there's a book actually called The New Anti-Semitism, which came, or some kind of report, I think, done by the Board of Deputies in the 1930s called The New Anti-Semitism. So, you know, you can find um, references to it going back, you know, quite, quite a long time. The main thing really only comes into uh discourse um after 1967 it's not immediately then it takes time for this to emerge and if you follow the discussions that i did you see how it, it, it was a gradual thing the way it it uh it it, it came into the discourse and in, into public use and then it took off ex sort of exponentially um uh, uh after 9 11 that's i mean i think the main turning points here are yes you see the thing beginning in 67 um uh but then you 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 have a collapse of communism i think that was very important but ultimately 9 11 and the things that happened around then the durban anti-racism conference the second intifada um what well, these things which generated the notion that there was global anti-semitism which was directed at israel um uh, uh, that's when really the new anti-Semitism, I think, as I, and as I argue in my book, that's when it uh, really became the new orthodoxy. Um, uh, now, just quickly looking to see some other points here. Um, yes. Um, uh, Sorry, just trying to find a particular point. I mean, let, let, perhaps I just work back work backwards. Diana's point about about uh, culture, I fully agree with. I think you know, that's what we need to uh, need to to concentrate on as well, because we have to show that there is Jewish diversity, and the the the, the problem with the collective Jew concept is that it reduces us to this singularity, and therefore, it, and that is not really reflective of uh, of the nature of uh, of Jewish of Jewish history. Um, uh, uh, so, oh yes, someone was asking about uh, the problem of emotion and how much emotion comes into this whole debate. And of course, I recognise that that's very very important. That uh, 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 that there is a tremendous amount of of emotion in the whole business of, of anti-Semitism. It's a very hot topic. It's a it's a it's it's a hot mess. And I've argued for decades now that. It, that hot hot topics need cool treatment um and that's what you know i see that's behind behind my book that you have to you have to use cool treatment for for this so that's the that's the only answer we have to understand one has to understand where the emotion comes from because of course there are terrible points in jewish history and you you know the holocaust can't be can't be ignored um but on the other hand um we need a cool approach a cool calm approach and that's why i think language and discourse is very very important the discourse of that's been used to to push new anti-semitism is very clever if you look at it, it you know it's it's catchy it's it's appealing it's it's uh you know clever use of uh, acronyms and this kind of thing so that ihra has become you know in america they don't call it that anymore they call it ira you know, I, I sort of so immediately you think of Gershwin and and something like that. So uh, 
so having having the right discourse i think is important i don't think we should dismiss it um i think that that is it's not the only way but i think it's a it's a it's a it's a it's an important way and certainly if we're looking for allies in the in in how to get a a, a bigger critical mass people like peter oborn who, who i know and i've known for for some time um is someone indeed i think who you know who would be an ally in trying to think through something something like that so um really i think i'd better stop there i mean i'm happy to write another book about all the other questions <laughs> that i've been asked um but uh, uh i think if you don't mind that's probably as much as i can do in the time available Tony, thank you ever so much it's been an absolutely fascinating kind of webinar and a really great event uh what a wonderful book you wrote and thanks to everyone who's contributed to the discussion.